Welcome to our first webinar of 2020. I'm Hamish Knox with Sandler here in Calgary. Going to share with you some ideas around negotiating success over the next 30-ish minutes. We will have an opportunity to continue our conversation if you so desire after the webinar. I'll share with you those options at the end of our conversation today and you'll get those links from Nisha in the wrap email before the end of this week. Before we dive into our content for the day, how does Sandler support our clients? Well, really we're working with businesses that are doing well, but they're sick and tired of the yo-yo in their sales engine, whether that's from turnover, revenue fluctuations, profits going up and down, client base expanding and contracting. We support them in turning their sales engine into a consistent, repeatable, scalable, full of full funnel freedom. Now let's dive into our content for today, starting with the dirty dozen negotiating tactics our prospects use on us. And we're gonna give you some tips on how to beat them. The first one is the flinch. This is taught at all negotiating workshops. And if you've ever done one, you've done this move usually happens when the salesperson puts a number on the table. And no matter what the number is, the buyer is taught to go, what are you crazy? How much do you charge for paper towels? And now of course the salesperson feels uncomfortable. So they start to make concessions in a vacuum, saying and doing things that are not necessarily in their best interest. The way we beat the flinch is by quantifying our prospects problem, or the payoff on the opportunity they would realize by working with us. Because then at that point, we can get confused, which is a really great place to be. So if we've identified that our pro prospect would get a million dollar payoff by realizing the opportunity that they're talking to, and we're asking them for $100,000 to work with us, and they flinch, we can circle back on their data and say, well, I'm a little confused. It seems like a 10 times return on your investment, $100,000 to a million, is not enough in your organization. But maybe I missed something. Another way to beat the flinch is to co-build a solution. David Sandler rule is they can't argue with their own data. So when they co-build a solution with us, less likely that our prospects are gonna come back and attempt to negotiate or flinch on ideas that they created. The next of the dozen is your competition is cheaper. And probably none of you have ever heard this, but let's just pretend that a prospect might say this to us. If we believe that there's gonna be competition, and in fact, if we are being invited into unseated incumbent, bring up the competition in advance. Might sound like prospect really glad that you invited us in today, kind of curious, you're already working with a current vendor, what would prompt you to change? And if they say anything other than price, now we have something to talk about that is not related to price when they come back and say, well, your competition is cheaper. Another way of beating your competition is cheaper is to discover in that pain step, something that your competitor can't necessarily fix or maybe has promised to do a bunch of times, but failed to deliver on. Then when our prospect circles back and says, well, you know, competition is cheaper, we can circle back on their own data and minimize or beat this of the dirty dozen. Third of the dirty dozen is the lower higher authority. Easiest way to beat this, only talk to people who can say no or yes, not no or I gotta go talk to my boss or I gotta think about it, take it to the committee. The challenge we have is we are oftentimes comfortable speaking at this middle level who can only say no or think it over as opposed to going up to the top to a person who can say no or yes. Now, this person may downshift us, which is great. Happy to have that conversation, but at least the person who can say no and yes is involved. Next of the, of the dirty dozen, good guy, bad guy. Similar to higher, lower authority, except this is the one where they'll say, well, you know, I like it, but 
Steve's really a big fan of your competitor and he's got the CEO's ear. So, you know, if you can give me a better deal, then maybe I can get around the fact that Steve likes the competition. Best way to beat this is to do a complete decision step, which is one of the three qualifying steps in the Sandler submarine. Part of the decision step is to get on the table the cast of characters, everybody who's going to be involved, even tangentially, in making the selection of someone to solve the problem that your prospect has brought you in for. And then when you do identify the cast of characters, we can say, you know, well, who's the gray knight? Who's the black knight? There's usually one in every organization, someone who's a big fan of our competitor or they just don't want to change. Who might that be? And if we bring that up when we're qualifying, we can actually mitigate or eliminate the potential for us having to deal with good guy, bad guy later on in our sales process. The next of the, of the dirty dozen is the hot potato. This is where our prospect attempts to make their problem ours. Oftentimes this will sound like, yeah, you know, happy to talk to you, but my budget just got cut by 50%. And in brackets, but I still want all the stuff that we talked about before. Remember that we're still selling to human beings. So they're probably feeling uncomfortable about even sharing this information with us. So we need to make them feel okay and say, appreciate you sharing that with me. These things happen, but then we want to put the hot potato back on our prospect because it's their problem, not ours. And say, how do you want us to deal with this? Us, we're in this together, but I'm not going to negotiate my, against myself. We don't say any of that to our prospect, but that's what we're saying at a psychological level. Number six is the emotional outburst. A little bit different from the flinch where the flinch is more about data that's shared and the emotional outburst oftentimes is a personal attack. You, know, you salespeople always try to do this to me or I think you're trying to screw me. Best way to get around this of the dirty dozen is number one, get eyeball to eyeball with your prospect, whether that's in person or video call. At worst, you do a phone call. You do not do this via a text-based communication. And then we need to strip a little line, which is a, a Sandler technique also called the negative reverse, where we gently push away our prospect to see if they'll pull us forward. So it might sound like, you know, glad we got together, kind of confused about your voicemail from the other day. It kind of sounds like you've made a choice to go in a different direction. And then we stop talking and our prospect is likely to give us new information. The answer may be, no, they haven't. They just got yelled at by their boss and they decided to take it out on a salesperson, which is okay. You can still get in heaven for that. Or it may be that, yeah, they've actually gone into a different direction it was outside of our prospect's control and they just had to blow off steam. Number seven, the fait accompli. This would happen to me when I sold software as service. Send the agreement over to a prospect. We've already agreed to all of the terms and conditions, all the commercial terms, and they'd send it back signed, but with a little minor change or minor in their opinion, but not necessarily so minor in ours when now they're cutting into our margins or telling us that we're going to deliver in a shorter time frame. Like any other bomb, the Sandler rule is if there's a bomb in the room, blow it up early before it goes off in your face. So in this case, we've agreed two terms with our prospect. We're high-fiving, we're excited, but we got to check that box of the agreement. So we'll say, you know, prospect, send over the agreement. When can we expect it back? And they'll give us a time frame and a commitment. And we'll say, that's great. You know, probably not going to happen here, but in my experience, every now and then, someone will get a hold of the agreement and they might make a little minor change to it before it gets sent back to us signed. And we're just supposed to accept those, those terms. What's going to stop us from having to have an awkward conversation about a change to the agreement that we've already done that happens after I send it over to you. 
again, by blowing up that bomb or bringing it up, up, up front, we're less likely to have to have that awkward conversation with our client after they've made that change. Number eight, the best and final offer, also known as the BAFO. You've probably had one of these in your career where your prospect says, listen, just give me your best and final offer. And then what they'll come back with is they'll say, great, now give me your best and really final offer, also known as the BARFO. Prefer that we don't have to uh, deal with the BAFO or the BARFO. So when our prospect comes back and says something about, give me your best shot, give me your best deal, sharpen your pencil, we can circle back by saying, if price wasn't an issue, who would you choose? And if they say us, then we can co-build a deal that works best for both of us or potentially take things off the table. You know, we sell our stuff at our price. If our prospect wants extra stuff, well, they either pay us extra or they give us extra. And that's part of that art and science of giving concessions that we'll talk about towards the end of our time today. Number nine, stonewalling. Uh, ghosting would be the more modern version of that. Prospect disappears on us. For our clients, they find the best way of eliminating this as a negotiating tactic is to do a decision timeline up front. Because the decision timeline asks a really critical question, which is, when do you need this problem solved by? When do you need this solution implemented by? Why then? What happens if you don't implement it by then? Because now our prospect can't argue with their own data and they've got a deadline that they've given themselves with a consequence. And so now, if they stonewall us, we can circle back to them and say, you know, we're getting close to one of those checkpoints that we had done in the timeline we laid out when we first spoke. I'm afraid that if we miss that checkpoint, we're going to miss your implementation deadline and those consequences are going to happen. I'd like to avoid that. Call me back. By the way, when you've got a prospect who's ghosting you, they don't care that you've left five voicemails or you've tried to reach them several times. Saying that just makes us sound like a whiny salesperson and less likely that our prospect is going to call us back. Number 10 is escalation. Escalation sounds like, hey, we've got a lot of work coming over here. So how about you give us a deal here and then we'll, you can do the work down here. The reality is this work over here tends not to materialize. So one of the ways to beat this is break it into separate sales. You might say something like, you know, we really appreciate the opportunity to look at phase two of this project. Are you okay if we do a deal and agree to terms on phase one first, and then we can talk about phase two. Number 11 is nibbling. Nibbling is where prospects just ask for a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. And finally, we do a deal where we're underwater on our margins and we have no idea how we got there. So whenever a prospect asks for a concession, no matter what it is, ask why. Ask why they want that concession and don't jump to offering them something. Let them define what they're looking for. You know, salespeople, when someone says, hey, can I have a discount? They'll typically say something like, yeah, sure, how's 5%? And the prospect might be thinking, well, I was hoping for two, but I'm not giving you the three points back. Let your prospect define the concession they're looking for, and then we get to choose whether or not that's acceptable to us. And if it is, what we're going to ask back for of greater or equal value. The last of the dirty dozen is changing the rules. A client of ours selling to exploration and production companies had a client who, in their words, every six months would put their project managers in a giant Yahtzee cup, shake it up, and throw those project managers out across the organization with no introductions and no backstory on the conversations that the previous project manager had had with my client. The challenge for my client was their sales cycle was a lot longer than six months. 
So they've spent six months building rapport, understanding pain, defining the cast of characters with one project manager. And then all of a sudden, they've got to do that all over again with a new project manager who wants to negotiate not from where our client started with the first project manager, but where they ended with the, with the previous project manager. So the way to beat this is number one, get everything in writing when you're in, the, in a negotiation. But number two is have what Sandler called walk away posture. It's okay to want the business. It's just not okay to need the business. As Soon as we look like we need the business, our prospects winning. So have that walk away posture where if your prospect wants to start negotiating down from where you've stopped with the previous contact, let your prospect know that you're comfortable walking away from this opportunity if they're not going to play fair. Now that we've talked about the dirty dozen that our prospect tries to do to us, let's look at the eight sources of leverage we have in negotiations. The first is belief. Sandler said that most salespeople beat themselves up in between their ears. And in a negotiation, most salespeople believe they are coming from a position of weakness as opposed to a position of strength. So if we can get our head on straight and come in with a mindset that we have equal business stature and that we are seeking to create a win-win opportunity or no opportunity, we now have leverage in our negotiations against those dirty dozen tactics. The next one is need. I touched on this one on the last slide. It's okay to want the business. It's not okay to need the business. Typically, we need the business when our sales funnel looks like this. And our prospects can sense that. So when we go into a negotiation, we are in a better position to have a successful win-win negotiation if our funnel is full. The third source of leverage is emotion. David Sandler said, sales is not a place to get your emotional needs met. So if we are emotionally attached to the outcome of closing a sale, win-win negotiation, as opposed to being attached to the process of disqualifying our prospect in order to qualify them, we are offside and our prospect will take advantage of that. Next source of leverage is time. This is really critical where that decision timeline comes in. If we can understand our prospects, implementation deadline, and the consequences for not hitting it, we have significantly more leverage in a negotiation than we would otherwise. Number five is relationships. And this speaks directly to the difference between a coach and a champion. Salespeople, myself included, love to talk about how they have champions in their prospect company. They might say, don't worry about it, boss. I got a champion. The difference is that a champion is willing to burn their internal political capital for you. They will advocate for your company on your behalf, whereas a coach will not. A coach will make introductions. They'll tell you who's who in the zoo. They'll give you all the inside political information that you might not know about, but they will stop when it comes to saying, I think we should work with this salesperson over that salesperson. The next is understanding. We are all commodities in our prospects' minds, which is why we end up in negotiations. If we don't make the time to truly understand the reasons why our prospect invited us in, the root causes for those reasons, and the payoffs both to the business and to them for either realizing that opportunity or solving those issues. So when we differentiate ourselves on how we sell by understanding instead of what we sell, which is a commodity in our prospect's eyes, we have more leverage in a negotiation that we may not even have to get to. Number seven is ownership. The longer an opportunity sits on our sales funnel, the probability of us removing that opportunity when it's clearly dead decreases exponentially. It goes to what's known as the sunk cost fallacy. 
So we think, well, I've already spent X number of hours or weeks or months on this prospect. I'll just keep them around because maybe hopefully someday they'll close. Disassociate yourself emotionally from the opportunity. If it's dead, it's dead. No does not mean no forever. Take ownership of keeping a nice clean funnel and you're more likely to have better leverage in negotiations when your funnel is full of real qualified opportunities. And the last source of leverage is skill. How do we get skill? Well, we practice. There's lots of analogies out there, usually sports related. Oftentimes they relate to golf. About a player hitting a shot in a tournament that the audience and the announcers thought was completely impossible. And when they were asked afterwards, they say, oh, I've practiced that shot hundreds of times or thousands of times for that one potential time where they might have to hit that shot. So as professionals, if we are not practicing our negotiating skills and our qualifying skills and our rapport building skills on a daily, weekly basis, we will not have the leverage to use those skills when we get into a negotiation with a prospect because we'll end up sounding like we went to a sales training class or read a book and we have a shiny new toy to try out that our prospect will very quickly bat aside and break. And now we're, now we're losing. So let's wrap up by talking about the art and science of giving concessions because it is both an art and a science. The first part of giving concessions is to give them slowly. Our prospects value the inch they had to fight for more than the foot you gave them when you were falling backwards. And that ties into give the concessions in small pieces. Already gave the example of the salesperson rushing to give a bigger discount than the prospect ever wanted. Let your prospect define the concession they're looking for. When it comes out of their mouth, it's real, and we also get to maintain control. Number three, make it look like it hurts when you give a concession. And it does because you're cutting your margins or you're potentially putting pressure on your delivery team to deliver in a shorter window. So make it look like it hurt when, it, when you're giving a concession. And then also get back something of greater or equal value for everything you give. For our companies in technology, if they're asked to give a, a concession in some way, oftentimes they're asking for an extra year on the agreement that they sign with their prospect. Other clients of ours ask for testimonials or case studies. Best practice for fi figuring out what is greater or equal value, put together a playbook of things that you want back from your prospects of greater or equal value to the concessions that they ask for. And lastly, first in, last out. First in, because the first person in to talk to that prospect is really the one who can differentiate themselves on how they sell instead of what they sell, really truly understand their prospects issues or opportunities and the payoffs to both the organization and to the prospect for solving those issues or realizing those opportunities. Last out because really it's only the last person who's in front of the prospect who has an opportunity to close. Now, just because we're not first in or last out doesn't mean we're not going to close sales through a negotiation every now and then. But if we can be proactive in our prospecting so we can get first in, create enough rapport, which is trust, and really differentiate on how we sell instead of what we sell so our prospect will give us that opportunity to be the last out, we will close more successful negotiations more easily. Appreciate you spending some time with us today to discuss some ways to be more successful in your negotiations. Where we go from here is one or all of three ways. First is we have a self-directed course called Negotiating Mastery. You can invest in it directly through our website Again, Nisha will send you all of these links before the end of the week. 
if you want to dive deeper into negotiation, and we also have a book coming out on negotiation uh, sometime later this year from our colleague Clint Babcock, click on that link, invest in the negotiating mastery course, circle back to us when you're done. We're kind of curious to hear how it goes. You could also join us in Orlando. Annual Sandler Sales and Leadership Summit is in Orlando. First week of March, we're a couple of weeks out, but you can still join us if you want to. And lastly, if you heard something here today where you're like, you know what, I'd really like to talk to Hamish about whether or not Sandler and Calgary could support my organization with negotiations and other aspects of creating that consistent, repeatable sales engine, our next step is to have a quick little discovery call to get to know each other a bit better. Have a fantastic rest of your day, rest of your week. And until we talk to you again, go sell something.